The Tom Woods Show, episode 934. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, we are inching toward the 1,000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, and I'd like you to join me for it at a special event in Orlando, September 9th. Featuring Michael Malice and Tom DiLorenzo as special guests and the great Eric July as MC. It's absolutely free, but you got to register. Check it out at TomWoods.com slash Orlando. Folks, we're capitalists on this show and we're not ashamed of that. And one of the easiest places to be a capitalist is on the Internet. So, for example, if you've got a website and you're not monetizing it, then you're a schmuck. I'm going to show you what I'm doing exactly step by step in this free ebook five paths to an online income check it out at paths to income.com hello everybody tom woods here what an article we are reviewing for you today oh my goodness this is an article written by a historian at rutgers university named james livingston and it's basically called f work all right we'll just Put it that way. That's what it's called. The article is arguing that work is really, really unfulfilling for a whole lot of people, and there aren't that many jobs anyway, and there are going to be ever fewer in the future, and they're just mind-numbing and dead-end and pointless and a waste of everybody's time. But we have this cultural attachment to the idea of work, so we keep on doing this. But surely there's a more humane way to live, and wouldn't we have a tremendous burst of creativity and energy if we weren't all tied down to miserable tasks as a way of supplying ourselves with the things we need to live? So anyway, there's so much in it, and somebody sent it to me and wanted me to answer it, and I thought, I can't do this alone. No way. So to share in the misery... Peter Klein is joining me today. Peter has been on the show in the past. He holds a Ph.D. in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. He is professor of entrepreneurship at the business school at Baylor University, where he's also senior research fellow with the Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise. He's also adjunct professor of strategy and management at the Norwegian School of Economics and Carl Menger Research Fellow at the Mises Institute. Peter, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here again. All right. We got a bunch of things here. We got to roll up our sleeves and start smacking down some fallacies here. So I already told people the article has to do with work and jobs and arguing that we need to just think completely differently about all this. And it's just got one proposition after another that you could you could debate. So even people who say we need a $15 minimum wage or we need full employment or whatever, these are the sorts of things that Bernie Sanders might say or Paul Krugman might say. Even these things are really fundamentally missing the point because he says – the number of jobs that will be available in the future, even right now, uh, is just not high enough to employ everybody who wants who would want to be employed to achieve full employment. We we can't do it. There won't be. There isn't enough work. Uh, and even if there is, who says work is so great? Uh, it's actually uh, stifling and demeaning in many cases. So then we're going to see what it is that he proposes. But we're, but let's start there. Um, let's go to. Let's start with this point. Uh, He says, already a fourth of the adults actually employed in the U.S. are paid wages lower than would lift them above the official poverty line. Almost half of employed adults in this country are eligible for food stamps. Most of those who are eligible don't apply. The market in labor has broken down along with most others. And then he says, the jobs, now he sounds like David Stockman, the jobs that disappeared in the Great Recession aren't coming back. Uh, The net gain in jobs since 2000 still stands at zero. Uh, and even if they do come back, these will be like part-time minimum wage jobs that nobody in his right mind would want to have. So, all right, assuming these figures are correct, what's Peter Klein's response to this? Give up on jobs? Yeah. Well, you know, Tom, this article is uh, challenging and confusing on so many levels. It's like there are so many fallacies, large and small, as you mentioned before, that are that are weaved in. It's It's really hard to know where to start. But, but this is the kind of situation where I think it might be useful 
to kind of start with a very simple theory or simple model of what an economy is and how an economy works. You know, people like myself who teach economics are often, you know, kind of uh, 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 we're chastised for thinking of these very simple scenarios. You know, what what would it be like for Robinson Crusoe on his island and then trying to work up from that to understanding something as complicated as the U.S. economy. But I think this article is a case where it would really have, you know, this author would really benefit from thinking through, you know, the most basic concept of what is work, you know, what is consumption, what is investment, because nowhere in the article is there any recognition whatsoever that, uh, you know, that he understands these very basic things. By starting there, then we can work up to more complicated questions like what role is the U.S., you know, minimum wage currently playing, uh, the sort of Stockman point about what types of jobs are d- going away during the recession. I don't think this author is even ready to have that conversation because of these absolutely nutty ideas about, you know, it, not having jobs at all, why people have jobs. You know, I sort of wonder, I, I see from the bio, I don't know this author at all, but he appears to be a historian uh, somewhere in Wisconsin, uh, sorry, at Rutgers. And I think, I mean, I guess he typed out this article on his on his Mac or on his PC, uh, maybe he's reading it and reading the comments on his iPhone. I mean, how does he think these goods and services came into existence? Where does he think computers came from? Where does he think the internet comes from? The food that he eats during the day, you know, the the the, the office in which he sits as he spins out these sort of crazy fantasies. I mean, where does he think all of that stuff came from? I, I didn't see anything in the article reading it twice uh, about, you know, what we would eat, you know, in this world where we don't have work anymore, where the food is going to come from, where the clothes are going to come from, where the internet's going to come from, and so on. So maybe, you know, maybe we ought to start by trying to think through, you know, what is a job? Why do people work? What's the purpose of labor as opposed to leisure? Um, You know, what's consumption? What's investment? I think, I think thinking through it at that level might help us to try to pull you know, try to, to, to figure out what this guy is really saying and how best to respond to it. Right. And of course, uh, your examples there are very good ones about what would we eat and all these things that we take for granted. Because when you think about what goes into what we eat and the, the work that goes into it, it's not all extremely intellectually and spiritually fulfilling work. It's sure. backbreaking work. Yeah. It's not the sort of thing you do uh, simply as a, as a side thing for fun That's just right. because you appreciate it inherently it it's because of the money you get it's because it is if i may say so a job yeah that's right and th- it is sort of what makes the world go round right i mean there you know there is such a thing as intrinsic intrinsically uh, uh enjoyable work i mean i'm sure a lot of what what you do and what i do when i'm reading and writing i enjoy it i mean i could i could have a uh, i could be in another profession besides the one that i'm in now maybe even earn a higher income but i but i enjoy doing the things that i'm doing now but that's not the kind of work that economists are really seeking to explain we're trying to explain why do people do as you said the backbreaking labor why do we put up with the tedium of you know, paperwork for those of us who have desk jobs or, you know, digging ditches or loading, loading trucks, putting boxes in trucks. Why does anybody do that stuff? Well, of course, not because of the intellectual fulfillment, you know, something that, uh, you know, Marx thought he had found a great flaw in the market system by identifying, you know, the sense of alienation that some people have from their jobs, uh, you know, to which I say to Carl, duh, I mean, no, no market economist ever claimed that work is fun, that we work because we enjoy it. Right now, we work because we need the stuff that work produces. You know, if you want to catch, a, if you want to eat fish for dinner and you're on an island, you got to go out and catch the fish. The fish are not just going to jump into your mouth, which is what people like uh, Professor Livingston uh, implicitly seems to think. So, of course, we want a world. What we desire is a world in which. You know, we get the most bang for the buck or the, the, the distasteful work that we must perform generates the highest return in terms of goods and services that we can consume, that we can consume now, that we can consume in the future, that we can you know, give to our children and so forth. So nobody wants to work for its own sake. 
you know, accepting the kinds of work that some people think is fun and, w- and would do even if they didn't get paid. We work because that's the only way we can consume. And you often, I don't know if it's a kind of a romantic era, you know, kind of a 19th century notion that there's some alternative world in which we just sort of sit around and, you know, food would fall from the trees. And a, a lot of people seem to have that kind of romantic notion. And you hear it even now uh, with uh, work on robots and, you know, nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. Boy, we're, you know, just around the corner is some kind of a Star Trek world where you just, you know, you just say the word ice cream sundae and it just materializes in front of you. Well, that ain't happening either. You know, somebody's got to build that technology. Somebody's got to maintain it. Somebody's got to extract the resources, the raw materials that keep it going and so forth. So as long as we human beings live in this fallen world in which we do have to, you know, sing for our supper, uh, some of us are going to be singing. And the question is, how do we set up the system in such a way that we can get the most you know, the best, most and best songs out of the singing we have to do. But, of course, his whole premise is that this is not actually something we have to do. This is something we've been conditioned to think that we have to do. Right. And he says, for example, that the fastest growing component of household income since 1959 has been transfer payments from government, and that by the turn of the current century, 20% of all household income came from this source. So in... There's nothing in principle different, he thinks, uh, between what exists now and what he's proposing in the sense that we would simply take that number and expand it very dramatically. But in effect, we're already, every one of us, in fact, uh, on the dole in one way or another. Uh, So Yeah, I found that point very interesting, and I I had to read it again between the lines to try to figure out, okay, you know, who who is providing the dole? Yeah. (laughs) In other words, you know, a transfer is like from A to B, so there's got to be an A out there somewhere who's creating some wealth so that it can be transferred to B. We can't just all, you know, we can't just all consume from each other. Somebody's got to be producing at some level. So, of course, this this is kind of a red herring, right? So in a world in which people put forth effort, people work in order to produce goods and services, or, you know, in a monetary economy, they, they exchange their labor with business people, with capitalists for money. The capitalists then exchange those products and services with consumers, uh, you know, for money. Uh, Of course, you can always layer on top of that, any kind of distributional scheme, or as some people would call it, you know, redistributional scheme that you want, you can have a king or you can have a state that says, yeah, well, but we're going to go in and take some of the fish that, you know, Tom Woods uh, produced, you know, through with with his fishing net and his fishing spear and so forth. And we're going to give those to Peter Klein, who can then consume more fish than the fish that Peter Klein actually produces. I mean, fine. I, I mean, there, there are lots of good reasons why that might be a bad idea, right? But, but no matter how much of this government shuffling around we layer on top of the, of the basic economy, we still have the basic economy in which the fish have to be caught by somebody. And, you know, a world in which 100% of our income comes from government, uh, comes from transfer payments, is just a world in which some other people somewhere, maybe ourselves, are producing the goods and services that are then transferred to somebody else. So I don't really see how this solves the problem. Right. It it seems to keep pushing it back to, I don't know, who is it going to be? Martians? Who's going to be who's going to be doing this? All right. Now, here are the key things I want to ask you, Well, particularly when we get to corporations in just a minute. But he says, how would we afford this? And by this, does he mean, I mean, I assume he means this idea that we don't need to work uh, or at least you don't need to do things that you find distasteful. Maybe you'd like to do something. Right. And so how would we afford this? And I don't exactly know what the this is, but it would be something like that. He says, oh, pfft. he actually says we can do so, quote, very easily. Now, what's very easily? Well, we raise the, what he calls the arbitrary lid on the Social Security contribution, which now stands at $127,200. Now, what he means by that is that the income you earn up to $127,200 is taxed with a social security tax, you pay into social security, but above that, you don't pay anything else, right? Right. Yeah. So we would just raise that. So you would get more money that way. And secondly, we would raise taxes on corporate income. So what's the problem, Peter? Yeah. I mean, I, I thought this was an interesting passage as well. I guess what what he thinks we when he says this, can, can we afford this? He's referring to the previous paragraph where he says, no matter how you calculate the federal budget, 
we can't afford to be our, to be our brother's keeper. I mean, but again, that gives away the whole show. What he, what he's talking about here is, you know, we can't afford to have some people working more and retaining a smaller share of what they earn to give it to other people who work less and consume a greater share of what other people produce. I mean, again, he's just right, so, yeah. about- so, so he's not really saying let's get rid of work and let's get rid of jobs. Uh, some people are going to still have jobs so that yeah. we can subsidize people whom he right. thinks would be better off not working at Walmart than working at Walmart. That's right. I, I think, I mean, I'm assuming that at least some of the way this piece is written is, you know, kind of tongue in cheek. Because, of course, as, as we're discussing, it's logically incoherent to have a world without work because then nothing would – there would be nothing to consume. Uh, really what he just means – this, I guess it's just kind of a, another uh, uh, way of uh, you know, clothing the sort of standard progressive argument that you know, some people consume too much and other people consume too little. He would like a world, I'm guessing, in which you know, Steve Jobs still puts forth the same amount of effort – to produce iPhones, uh, you know, a, a, a factory workers who work hard would continue to work just as hard. Everybody would work as hard as they do now, or maybe even harder. But he would just spread out the the the, the proceeds more evenly, right? No one could earn more than X dollars. Nobody can earn less than X dollars. So he, he doesn't say anything about the size of the pie, or he's assuming that the pie would remain the same size or maybe grow. He just wants to you know, ha- have more evenly sized pieces. I think basically that's that's the only kind of message that that makes any sense in this piece. Now, is that is that a you know is that sound thinking? Uh, is that is that uh, appropriate from a moral and ethical standpoint? Um, what would actually happen to the pie? I mean, this, the pie metaphor is not quite right. I don't want to take it too literally, but you know, would the pie actually shrink if we were to Im- impose the kind of scheme? That he prefers, but that's got to be what he's talking about, and you know, talking about changing, uh, getting rid of the social security contribution cap, raising taxes on corporate income. I mean, he assumes that corporations would still exist and would still produce stuff. We just take away more of the net income and you know, give it to somebody else. Okay, fine. I mean, then the question is, well, if you increased tax rates, as he's proposing explicitly, and you know, implicit tax rates. What would then happen to the economy? What would happen to production? That's where we have something we can actually talk about. Yeah, well, let me read you his reasoning behind why he thinks raising corporate taxes won't cause a problem for employment. He says that, in fact, raising taxes on corporate income can't have these effects, these effects being – Uh, being a disincentive to investment and thus job creation. He says, corporations have been multinational for quite some time. In the 1970s and 80s, even before Ronald Reagan's signature tax cuts took effect, approximately 60% of manufactured imported goods were produced offshore overseas by U.S. companies. That percentage has risen since then, but not by much. Uh, And then he says, uh, the bottom line is this, most jobs aren't created by private corporate investment, so raising taxes on corporate income won't affect employment. Since the 1920s, economic growth has happened even though net private investment has atrophied. What does that mean? It means that profits are pointless except as a way of announcing to your stockholders and hostile takeover specialists that your company is a going concern, a thriving business. You don't need profits to reinvest to finance the expansion of your company's workforce or output as the recent history of Apple and most other corporations has amply demonstrated. So investment decisions by CEOs have only a marginal effect on employment employment. All right, Peter, what do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I, Tom, I have no idea what this paragraph could possibly mean. Um, it's confused on so many levels, and, and it just doesn't make sense. Um, first of all, I mean, of course, he says since the 1920s, economic growth has happened, even though net private investment has atrophied. I mean, that's not technically correct. Um, by some measures, net private investment has fallen. By other measures, it's risen. And of course, what matters you know, the, the, he's looking at sort of accounting measures of investment, dollar accounting measures of what companies classify as investment. But of course, from an economics point of view, we're interested in quality, not quantity. I mean, again, where does he think the iPhone came from? I mean, someone, you know, Apple did the research and development to come up with the develop the technology. You know, Apple and its and its foreign partners, like uh, Chinese companies, have invested in manufacturing capacity. I mean, I don't I don't know where he thinks 
that investment would have. I don't where I don't understand where he thinks goods and services would come from if investment were literally zero. Um, he says uh, he says you don't need profits to reinvest to finance the expansion of your company's workforce or output. I mean, again, but where does he think the expansion came from? It was what was it financed by? You know, right. transfer payments. I mean, I yeah, know right, I, I, right. I can't imagine what he could possibly mean here. Um, you know, this this deal about you know you're signaling something to your stockholder. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all. I don't think he understands what a corporation is. Um, his the little there's a blurb in the article you didn't uh, point out where he goes on didn't read where he goes on a little rant against Citizens United which suggests that from a kind of a legal and economic point of view, he really doesn't understand what a business firm is. He certainly doesn't understand what a corporation is, what, you know, what, what, it, what is the notion of legal personhood, for example. But of course, all investment is financed ultimately by profit, where by profit we mean you know, the excess of what we produce over what we need to consume right away. Right? I mean, that's, that's absent profit. There can be no savings or investment by definition and so there's, of course, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have iPhones or we wouldn't have any of the uh, technology that we have. We wouldn't have the productive capacity that we have without, you know, without some people producing more than what they need to consume right at that moment. Again, think back to Robinson Crusoe on his island. You know, the only way that he can get a fishing net, which would then expand his ability to fish in the future, is by taking a day away from catching fish with his hands and eating them, right, to build a net. So he's got to, in the day before he builds a net, he's got to catch a few extra fish. He catches 10 fish. He only eats five of them. He holds on to five to eat the next day while he's building a net. You know, if he only, if he eats all of the fish that he catches every day, he can never spend a day doing anything other than catching more fish. So there's no way he could ever have any savings. There's no way he could ever invest to produce a, you know, to come up with a new and better way to get outputs out of inputs, unless he starts with some saving, right, by consuming less than he's currently producing. And so in a world where there are no profits in this sense, there can be no investment, and then you can never consume at more than a subsistence level. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense what he's saying here. Well, what about the robots argument that, look, there aren't going to be any jobs anyway. Yeah. Uh, everything's going to be done by robots. So we're going to have to do it because this is right. Isn't this the common thing now that yeah. we need the even libertarians are saying we need the universal basic income and that'll solve that problem? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's not really different from the people who said, well, when the automobile was developed, you know, 120, 130 years ago. Uh, well, gosh, we won't need people to raise horses and take care of horses and make horseshoes and so forth. So, uh, you know, things will just move around magically by these horseless carriages and then we don't need you know, we've loss of jobs. I mean, a robot is not really different from any other piece of capital equipment, right? I mean, uh, these you know science fiction kind of robots might be great. But I mean, I've got one of those little robotic vacuum cleaners at my house. I've got a Roomba vacuum cleaner. I mean, so it's technically a robot um, and it does make my life easier because you can push the button and let the little Roomba do its thing and I can go off and do something else rather than holding a vacuum cleaner. Um, is that qualitatively different from, you know, me going from having only a broom and a dustpan to having a conventional vacuum cleaner or, you know, me going from picking up dirt with my hands to picking up dirt with a broom and a, a, a dustpan. I mean, no, uh, robots are another kind of capital good. They can perform, you know, it's just like any other kind of capital equipment. They, they increase our productivity as human beings. They make us able to do more and to do better things with less, less amounts of effort, which frees us up either to consume leisure if we like, or to spend our valuable time and effort producing other things and more things, you know, and, and of course, as with the automobile example, um, you know, this whole notion of will the robots take away our jobs? I mean, somebody's got to build the robots. Somebody's got to maintain the robots. You know, anybody who's ever used a personal computer or an electronic device of any kind knows that they are not self-maintaining. Okay, so you know, there's going to be some tech support people that you call and say, "Hey, my robot broke," and you know, you spend hours on them uh, with, with their with their broken English as I try to tell you how to reboot your robot. I mean, the robots are not qualitatively different from any other kind of technological 
uh, improvement in, in in my view. I've got a little thing on on robot. I guess I should link to. I gave a talk at the Mises event in at Harvard last year uh, on, and I hit on robots. So let me write down robots episode. I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 934. That's where you can also read this article, by the way, if you want to gouge your eyes out, you can read this article at tomwoods.com slash 934. Um, I want to talk about just, he says, uh, I mean, the philosophical stuff is the worst, which is why I don't even, I don't even want, I want to get into that. I want to get into the economics with you, but he says uh, that this commitment we have to work entails defining ourselves in terms of our productivity and that we're only worth as much as the labor market can register, um, which parenthetically is just a dumb way to think. And no one has ever proposed that because in the sa- if that were true, then we would have to say that it, let's just think of the greatest works of literature that you can. I can find them in a $10 paperback edition. Does that mean that in some grand abstract scheme of things, War and Peace is worth only $10? What does that mean? That's a stupid thing to say. That's not what market prices are about. They're not giving you some abstract judgment of your worth in the world any more than they give the judgment of – I mean we need water to survive and water is really cheap. So does that mean the market is saying water doesn't matter? That, that has nothing to do with what prices are about. But what I want to ask you about is, he says, we must also know that this principle, this idea of work and productivity as defining who we are, plots a certain course to endless growth and its faithful attendant, environmental degradation. So we also can't be working because if we work, we're going to destroy the environment. You know, Tom, as you mentioned in your uh, example with War and Peace, I mean, no you know, no free market economist, uh, no academic, no writer, nobody that we know, nobody in our circles says that your wage is a measure of your moral worth. No one says that, uh, you know, Justin Bieber is more, you know, artistically has more artistic merit than, you know, Beethoven because his concerts are currently selling out and Beethoven symphonies don't or whatever. You know, as Mises pointed out in his book, The Anti-Capitalist Mentality, uh, you know, market prices, the profits of uh, firms, the wages of certain producers on the market, you know, they simply reflect the preferences of consumers in terms of what they're willing to buy and what they're willing to sell. And and nothing more than that. There's no moral layer that's that's that sort of fits on top of that. It's the same thing with economic growth. Um, you know, economic growth is morally neutral. In a market economy, in a free society, we get the level of economic growth that consumers, entrepreneurs, uh, investors, workers desire, right, as revealed by their choices to to work a little harder or to work a little less hard, to save and invest more, to save and invest less, to consume now versus deferring consumption to the future. Again, this is another case where it's useful to look at it at the level of the household. You know, your listeners can think from from their own point of view or from the point of view of themselves and their family members. You know, we're always choosing. You have a certain amount of income that, that, that you get from working. You can spend it all now. You can spend more than you're currently earning by borrowing, or you can try to spend less than you're currently earning and put that money in the bank. Now, what do you do with that money that's in the bank if you're saving? Well, you can just hold on to it and hope to retire at age you know, 50 or 60 and, and consume it then. You can hope to pass it on to your children, or you can take that money and uh, remodel your kitchen. That's something that we're currently doing, and so I'm thinking a lot about kitchen remodels. Or you could add another room on to your home, or you could buy a larger home. You know, that's that's those things all represent a kind of growth, right? You can make your domicile larger or nicer or better in some way, or you can choose not to do that. And there may be all kinds of reasons, both practical, philosophical, ethical, about what's the right thing for you to do or for your family to do in that particular situation. But it's never the case that you're sort of mindlessly compelled to take all of your excess earnings and invest them in getting a new refrigerator or moving into a bigger house. You can choose to do that or not. Likewise, whenever I hear uh, commentators talk about growth and this constant pressure for an economy to grow. I mean, who knows, there may be, you know, from a psychological or sociological or philosophical point of view. I mean, yeah, it may be that some particular culture in which we live 
uh, encourages us to spend more, to drive a bigger car. I mean, that's fine. But to blame that on the market is just another way of blaming that on human beings. Again, it would be like blaming the market for the fact that Justin Bieber concerts sell out. Actually, maybe he's old fashioned now. Uh, 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 Ariana Grande. Is it the market's fault that lots of parents are sending their you know, preteen kids to go watch an Ariana Grande concert, which is not to my tastes. And, uh, you know, if I say I blame the market, that's just another way of saying I blame human beings. I blame human preferences. I blame people's free will. I mean, it's okay, I could do that if I want, but there's no, you know, economic analysis doesn't have much to say about that. I'm just a curmudgeon who hates humanity. Um, let, just, you know, the, a couple more paragraphs. I, you're totally right about all that stuff. Uh, of course, I want to. I want to go toward the end because he says, "What purposes could we choose if the job, economic necessity, didn't consume most of our waking hours and creative energies? What evident yet unknown possibilities would then appear? How would human nature itself change as the ancient aristocratic privilege of leisure becomes the birthright of human beings as such?" Okay, this reminds me of that that quotation that uh, Rothbard was fond of from Marx, uh, from the German ideology. Marx wrote, In communist society where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, shepherd, or critic. So straight out of Marx there. Uh, think of the amazing possibilities if we're not constrained by work. And of course, he really means if certain people aren't, certain people who would be better off sitting there, uh, you know, painting a picture rather than, than, than being a cashier at Walmart or waiting on me at Waffle House because that's demeaning to them. And we're not even getting into the point that for basically everybody who's ever lived, they started with a crummy job and the job did teach them valuable things. I and mean, even something that he in his elitist fashion looks down upon can actually teach people valuable things. But, but all the same, this idea that uh, without that, all these magical, wondrous possibilities open up. I, again, maybe I don't. Maybe he's trolling us in some way. I mean, I'm not even. I don't normally say that. I just say, well, here's a guy with different views from me, and let me try and refute them. But so we're going to have the. Really, I bet you, if I read both of these, if I included that passage from Marx in this paper, it would fit right in. You wouldn't even know I had done it. Yeah, this is the old Marxist idea of the new socialist man, right? That that human nature is somehow a product of capitalism and that under socialism or whatever this guy's ideal system, uh, however we want to describe it, you know, pe pe the, the very nature, I mean, again, he, he's not even coy about it. You know, how would human nature itself change? So he wants human nature to be something other than it is. He, he wants reality to be something other than it is, right? He, he wants there to exist a world in which as he says, you know, the aristocratic, ancient aristocratic privilege of leisure becomes the birthright of human beings as such. Well, again, that's a, you know, that's a complete fantasy world in which the food literally falls from the trees, right? I mean, gee, I don't know, Tom, you and I might enjoy that world too, but I don't, you know, outside from a science fiction or, you know, sort of fantasy novel, I'm not sure what's really the point of speculating about it. It certainly doesn't have any policy relevance. So this author has not provided us with any argument for how a world like that could exist in which people are able to consume without, I guess he means, you know, a few people would work or, I, I don't know, I, I, again, I, I suppose his confusion is the belief that if we just had a few, you know, if, 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 if Steve, Jobs, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and a few other high earners would just keep doing exactly what they're doing now, but stop selfishly consuming all of the income and just spread it around, then the rest of us could just enjoy the ancient aristocratic privilege of leisure. I guess that's what he means. Since he's provided us no, he hasn't given us any uh, uh, explanation of, of how we live in a world like that, what we consume. Well, just to wrap up then, what could we say to him if he says legitimately that the jobs that have been created since 2000 are, you know, the, the breadwinner jobs are basically at net zero and that there are a lot of, you know, 
waitress and bartender style jobs. Nothing wrong with those jobs, by the way, in my view. I've, a lot of people have had those jobs. Um, people I've, you know, my my mother all the way on down. Nothing wrong with those jobs, but they are usually classified by people like this as being uh, dead end jobs. They don't go anywhere. Right. So their point is that that's the kind of job being created. We're not seeing really good jobs. And so now not many people would take it to the extreme of saying, well, therefore forget jobs when, and work is stupid. But uh, I mean, there is something to this, right? There's something sure. about this job market that's kind of screwy. Yeah. Tom, I think there are a couple of different ways we could respond. I mean, w- one is to quibble a little bit with this notion of what's a good job and what's a bad job. For example, uh, earlier this summer, I was was on a, fam- a family vacation in, in uh, Europe, and I took my kids to see the Palace of Versailles. And so we're looking at all the splendor and grandeur you know, of Louis XIV, 15th, 15th, and 16th. It's just spectacular, uh, you know, a, 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 a conspicuous consumption uh, on a scale, you know, rarely seen before. But I remember asking my kids, I said, well, look, keep in mind that, you know, Louis the 16th did not have internet. You know, he did not have YouTube or Netflix. He had no penicillin, right? If he wanted to travel somewhere, it was by horse-drawn carriage. He couldn't fly to another continent. Uh, you know, there's so many things that, that even the poorest of people in a modern industrial society have available to them flush toilets, you know, surgery, uh, anesthetic, and so forth, that um, even the wealthiest people of the pre-capitalist world, you know, would, would never have dreamed of. So uh, by no means am I saying that the, the, the poorly paid waitress or factory worker has it easy. I'm certainly not saying that at all. But at one level, we can say what we mean today by saying you have a crummy job is, you know, you're on your feet for eight hours a day, um, you know, you only have one car and it's a used car. You only have two TVs in your house. Um, you know, of course, you've never known hunger, but you don't always get to eat, you know, at a nice restaurant once or twice a week. I mean, what we mean by living below the poverty line today, throughout most of human history, what the way people live under the poverty line today would have been regarded as just unimaginable luxury, you know, throughout most of human history. Again, I don't say that to be callous. And if you believe, you know, unfortunately, we as human beings suffer greatly from the sin of envy, or to use more modern terminology, you know, there's a lot of social comparison. And so, yeah, we don't feel wealthy because our friend down the street has it better than we do. I mean, from a moral and ethical point of view, I, I think as a, as a human being, as a, as a parent, you know, as a teacher, I, that we should not be that way, that we should not encourage envy. Okay, let's throw that point to the side for the moment and say, suppose we we assume that these low wage jobs uh, really are bad jobs. Why do we have them? Why don't we have more better jobs in an economy such as ours? Well, of course, this may come as a surprise to uh, the author of this article, but you know we do not live in free market utopia, right? Even in the United States, he talks about somewhere about undoing the Reagan revolution, which I think to this author means you know, we have pure, untrammeled, Ayn Rand style, dog eat dog capitalism you know, in America today. And look at these, all these negative consequences. Of course, we have a highly, you know, we live in a mixed, what Mises called the mixed economy. You know, the, the government already consumes what, you know, 30 to 40% of GDP. So we already live in a quasi socialist system. You know, it's, it's as good as it is because of the amount of capitalism that is still allowed to exist by our, you know, overlords and, and the intellectual classes and so forth. But so another answer would be, look, I mean, people who are working uh, low wage jobs, manufacturing jobs, a lot of that is due to intervention in the economy by government labor markets. We don't have free markets in labor. Of course, the corporate sector is incredibly hobbled by different kinds of regulation, the financial sector and so forth. If we had genuine deregulation, if we allowed capitalists and entrepreneurs to earn profits, to invest those profits, to generate even more and better kinds of economic growth, I think we would th- that would have a very positive effect on the labor market, even, even at the low end. As Mises pointed out, and many others have pointed out, you know, wages are determined by the productivity of labor on the margin. The reason the waitress gets paid 
you know, $12 an hour or $15 an hour or whatever is because in the judgment of the employer, the waitress is producing that much value, you know, per, per hour worked. Imagine that that waitress had uh, better equipment, had ac- the restaurant had access to a more efficient supply chain. Uh, there were fewer, you know, FDA rules that make food more costly. We got rid of the agriculture department that massively increases the prices of certain kinds of food items. Just think how much more productive that waitress would be. She might be generating $20 or $25 or $30 worth of value per hour, and her wages would tend to increase as her productivity increases. So if we're concerned about low wage uh, employment, the solution to that is to make low wage labor more productive. And we do that by encouraging entrepreneurship, by allowing the capitalist system to work, by deregulating, freeing up the monetary system, and so forth, the kinds of things that are discussed every day on TomWoods.com. Indeed, they are. Now, that was a very nice flourish. And what, in fact, I, after you say that, I don't think there's anything else we can add. So I'm going to just say I think we have we've done as much as, as people can be expected to do with this this article. I just somebody sent it to me and I read it and I thought, you know, I could do this by myself. But, uh, you know, I, I just no. I keep I, all I'm, the fun uh, to myself. Exactly. And I, th- I thought I haven't had Peter Share on in a joy. while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's great. Well, next time I see you, I think we'll pr- be at the Mises University program, I assume. and That'll be great. There we will talk about the exact opposite of these kinds of things. Right. So, uh, so I look forward to that as I do every year. Thanks, Peter. All right. My pleasure. See you later. All right. Before I let you go, I've got a highly unusual website to tell you about that a listener – created, and it's called Automotive, but not A-U-T-O, Automotive, Automotive, like odd, O-D-D-I, Motive, Automotive.com finds and shares unusual vehicles, most of which are available for sale somewhere on the internet, and I'm telling you, you will, you'll have a blast going through this site looking at the photographs of extremely unusual automobiles uh, they're unusual for all sorts of different reasons, but you're really going to like this site. They add color commentary, usually, usually with a healthy dose of sarcasm. Uh, they say, we're not opposed to rust buckets, homemade jalopies, or concourse-ready show cars. Reader finds will always be welcomed. Well, anyway, check out automotive.com. You're gonna, it's fun. It's a fun site to look through. And... Um, I don't think there's anything else quite like it. So Audimotive, O-D-D-I, Motive, Audimotive.com is the listener website mentioned for today. So we're linking to that at TomWoods.com slash 934, where, of course, we're also linking to the article that Peter and I discussed today. So, again, if you'd like to get a special mention on the show to get a boost for your brand new website, make sure you get your hosting through my link, and I'll give you this publicity and a bunch of other goodies, including membership in my private bloggers group, where you can get special help when you need it. So get the details on all that at tomwoods.com slash publicity. If you're enjoying the show, consider joining me as a supporting listener over at supportinglisteners.com. One of the perks you get of the eight gazillion is that you are invited to a special dinner with me on September 9th, 2017, immediately before the 1,000th episode event in Orlando. The supporting listeners get to come to a a dinner. There'll be no cost to you out of your pocket. I'm picking the whole thing up, but that's only for supporting listeners. The dinner is my way of saying thank you. So anyway, get all the details at supportinglisteners.com, and I will see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.